guys welcome to what might be no guarantees though because i'm crazy what might be the final pre-recorded segment of my watercolor crash course today we're talking about watercolor techniques and i really hope that you guys can paint along if you missed our last video last time we talked about color mixing we talked about warm colors, we talked about cool colors, we talked about atomic mixing, we talked about optical mixing, we talked about transparency, we talked about opacity, and we even talked about granulation. So we talked a lot about color and paints yesterday. So if you missed that one, I highly recommend you check it out, but it's absolutely not necessary for today's tutorial, class, hangout, crash course, I don't know what to call it. Next time, Probably, although I've already come up with two more ideas for more crash courses, but maybe we're gonna do a live stream where I answer your troubleshooting problems live, as well as ones that have been pre-submitted. So it's a great chance to hang out and I really hope I'll see you guys then. Keep an eye on the community tab because I will announce it there and I'll probably announce it in the shorts as well. So grab your paints, your brushes, and your paper. And actually before we dive in too far, I do want to mention, because I didn't mention it in the video, that I am painting on a large sheet of Arches watercolor paper, one of the big ones, because it was for a class demo. You don't need to work that big, but I would recommend you work larger than you might so that you have plenty of room. We're gonna be doing 12 rectangles with multiple techniques in each rectangle. So realistically, the larger a piece of cotton rag water, cold press, because we need that texture today, cotton rag because we need that absorbency today, watercolor paper because we're painting today. The larger a sheet you can get, the better. Personally, if you're gonna go out and buy something, and I'm not absolutely not saying you need to, but if you do, please avoid Michaels because they keep their watercolor sheets out in the open, and I have literally never seen their sheets not greasy, dirty, damaged, torn, and I would hate for you to spend your money because Michaels is kind of expensive for its place. I'd hate to see you spend your money to get something that's already ruined. What I would recommend is trying to buy it from a local brick and mortar store. They're gonna be able to make sure that you're happy with your watercolor paper. Um, if you want to though, I highly recommend you paint on a watercolor block today. That way you don't have to stretch it or anything. It's gonna hold it tight for you. And uh, yeah, I think that covers our bases. So let's start talking about technique. Now we're gonna do some watercolor technique demonstrations. I have a few of these here on the channel. This one is going to be new and improved. We are working on a large sheet of arches, cotton rag, watercolor paper, and I'm going to demonstrate at least 12 techniques for you guys. So. Rather than stretching it, what I'm going to do is use some of these Chinese watercolor weights just to help me hold the paper down. You could also tape it down if you want to. If you're following along at home, you could do this on something that's known as a block bound watercolor pad. We'll talk about that more later or maybe we've talked about that already. I'm kind of recording this out of order to help me prepare for one of my watercolor classes in Ascension Parish and I'm starting with the techniques. So we've got it weighted down. I am going to use professional grade watercolor for this. I am using the Core Mini palette. And what I'm going to do is I am going to pre-activate it with a spritz of water. I'm gonna do that off camera. And this is going to allow the paints to kind of soak up that water and be readily available when I need them. And this palette is messy because it is well loved and oft used. The other materials I'm going to be using for this part of the demonstration so far I'm going to start out with a glaze, so I have a flat watercolor brush. I also have a ceramic palette. This is just a plate from Dollar Tree. I've got some paper towels off to the side, and I have a cup of clean filtered water. I am living and working in Southeast Louisiana. We have a lot of minerals in our water, so I prefer to work with filtered water when I'm doing watercolor paintings or even watercolor demonstrations and tests, just because that eliminates one possible area for things to mess up. So we are going to start out 
with glazing way over here. I'm going to adjust the camera so that you guys can see it a little bit better. But basically, glazing is a very, 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 very simple technique, but it's one you're going to use all the time. We're going to put down one layer of color, allow it to dry totally and fully, and then we're going to glaze another layer of color on top of it. And this is one of the fundamentals of watercolor. So that's a glaze, pretty simple. It doesn't have to just be two colors. You can do a wet and to wet glaze. You can do a wet and to wet wash underneath where you have two colors mingling with each other. I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. And then do a glaze with two different colors mingling on top of them. There could be a to like a glaze of the same color just layered over and over and over again. So glazing is a really flexible way of watercolor. It's also a very common way of watercolor. It's a very common watercolor technique. And it's one that most artists are going to utilize when they're painting with watercolor. This is also a great opportunity to get some beautiful color play. So this is what's known as optical mixing because the colors themselves never mixed, but your eye is mixed mixing the two colors to create a sort of greenish color. And for this, I chose a cool yellow, and then I chose ultramarine blue, which is a granulating blue. And granulating means you can see some of that sedimentation, some of that pigment kind of sedimenting out. That's particularly noticeable on cold pressed papers like this here. And that's another technique, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. So wet and wet can be done a variety of ways. You can either apply clean water and then dab in paint. You could do a glaze or a wash of color and then dab in color. There's a variety of ways to do wet and to wet, but I'm going to do this in a pretty simple way. We're just gonna take two colors and kind of let them blend into each other. And cotton rag papers are really a good choice, especially cold pressed cotton rag papers because the fibers are more open and they're more able to receive the colors and allow the colors to kind of blend into each other than hot pressed papers, which have that kind of smooth ironed out finish or cellulose papers, which are made of wood pulp. And they're really more like cardstock with kind of a watercolor texture embossed into them. So the cool thing about wet and to wet is that the colors kind of diffuse into each other and you can get some really cool effects. It's also a great way to add a little bit of randomness to your watercolor painting. So if your work is starting to look a little too color by numbers, some wet and to wet can be a great way to kind of mix things up. So now that we've talked about wet and to wet a little bit, I've demonstrated a couple of different ways you can do it. We're going to move on to great graduated or gradiated washes. So a wash is basically a thin, very wet, very watery application of color. A graduated wash is the same thing, but as we go either up or down and to the side, whichever direction, it gets more intense. Now, sometimes that can be through the addition of other colors. Sometimes it can just be through a thicker saturation of our individual color. Kind of depends on what you're looking for. I'm going to do it with just one color. So we have done glazing, which is a type of wet into dry. We have done wet into wet. We have done a graduated wash or gradiated wash, which is a type of wet into wet. Next, we're gonna talk more about wet over dry. And the wet 
in wet over dry specifically just refers to how loose the paint is or how much water there is in the paint. So for wet into over dry, it's basically like glazing. We're going to apply a layer of color. We're going to allow it to dry fully and it's going to be a thicker layer of color, hence the dry part. And then we're going to glaze a looser wash of watercolor on top of our existing color. So now that our dry layer has for the most part dried and one of the ways you can tell is you put the back of your hand on it and if it's still cool to the touch it's still a little bit wet it is a little bit cool to the touch but i'm trying to demonstrate a lot of techniques for you guys today so i'm going to go ahead and move forward i don't think it'll make a whole lot of a difference but if you were to do a glaze while it was still pretty wet it might reactivate the prior layer and you might want that you might not want that it kind of just depends it might reactivate the prior layer anyway because because some colors are going to be more prone to lifting and moving than others. So there's a lot of variables that come into watercolor, but that's one of the things that makes it so much fun is there's so many different ways to kind of make it your own. So, and the only way to really get good at it is to just dive in and start playing around with your paints. So we're doing wet over dry. I am going to grab an alizarin crimson, which is kind of a pinkish red in this particular palette. I'm gonna add a lot of water. I'm describing this for you guys because I'm doing it off camera. And we're going to go this way. So we're kind of doing a lighter glaze of color on top of our existing color. If you want consistent color, I recommend going ahead and mixing up a larger batch of that color, maybe in a weld palette. That way you have all that color ready for you. It's better to mix too much than to have to go back and remix it. Watercolor is a really economical material. A little bitty bit of paint goes a really long way. So over mixing, as long as you're not like hugely over mixing is common and not really a problem. If you have a ceramic palette, if you allow the paint to dry on your palette or a butcher's block palette or even a plastic palette, then you should be able to reactivate it later on if you want to. So we've got our wet over dry done. Now we're going to do dry over wet. So that means applying kind of a loose wash of color and then going in with a brush that is saturated, that has, now you can do different degrees of how much water is on your brush or how much paint is on your brush. But generally when I think of dry over wet, I'm thinking of approaching mass tone, i.e. the darkest version we're going to get from that specific color. So the paper is still gonna be wet, the watercolor is going to be wet, and I want you guys to pay attention to what happens to our quote unquote dry paint as it goes into the wet paint. I'm gonna try to really saturate this so that we have some time to actually apply our dry paint. As you guys can see, the color is diffused out somewhat, but not as much as they normally would with wet into wet. We do, we can still get some sharper, although not entirely sharp transitions, just because we waited a little while longer and the pigment was a little bit thicker, a little bit drier. So this could be a really useful technique as well. Now, to me, wet into wet, looser, looser mixture of paint, dry into wet, not as loose, not as much water. But for me, there's not really much delineation between the two in my watercolor illustrations and my watercolor painting. I do use both from time to time, but I'm not like consciously thinking to myself, okay, this is a dry into wet sort of application. So though they're both helpful, but it's kind of like glazes, which are way over there, kind of out of view versus say dry over dry, you know, same sort of category. It might be a fine line between how you define it just based on how wet the paints are. <laughs> 
our final kind of basic application technique, we have dry over dry. And typically I've been defining dry as not having as much water, but also as the paper itself being dry. Dry over dry is a lot like glazing where, where we are applying one layer of color on top of another. So with this one, it is a fairly saturated wash of color, not as saturated as we could get. This is at the bottom here where I used a barely wet brush to apply watercolor to it. But basically when you're applying dry over dry, you might get some dry brush, which we can talk about a little bit later on, but it's basically this kind of speckling where the brush starts to skip over the texture of the paper. And that's more prevalent on textured papers like cold press or not slash rough press. But basically you're just building up opacity when you're doing dry over dry. And that's what I use for kind of the final layers of a watercolor illustration. Like if I'm painting eyelashes or if I'm painting in some surface design onto the clothing, I kind of save it for the finishing touches because if you do a glaze on top of it, it can cause it to reactivate and kind of melt, which maybe you want that. Maybe you're going for kind of like a rainy day sort of illustration and you want those colors to kind of run down the page. That could be really cool. But but if you don't want that, then save this sort of stuff towards the end of your watercolor illustration. Now that we've covered some of the more basic watercolor techniques, we get to talk about some of the more fun sort of special effect-esque watercolor techniques. Now, some of these can also fall into watercolor troubleshooting, like our next technique, water blooms. So basically, we are going to apply a wash of color, then we're going to dab in some clean water and watch what it does to our watercolor. This technique is pretty simple. Basically, clean water in this cup, used a clean brush, and I basically just drip drop the water on. You can also apply water along the edges and have it pool into it. And what it does is it kind of pushes the pigment outside of the area and it creates these really pretty blooms. Now, this falls into the troubleshooting category because sometimes if you've got too much water on your brush or if you're working with a synthetic brush and your brush drops all over your paper, it can inadvertently cause blooms. Now, you see this pooled area right here? That is really simple to fix. Let me demonstrate that for you guys. So I'm grabbing a paper towel and I'm gonna do what's called using a thirsty or creating a thirsty brush. Now this still has our original paint color in it. I'm just going to dip it in to the pooled water, trying not to touch the paper. And what that's going to do is that's gonna suck up that extra watercolor without removing too much color or disturbing the paint that's already on the paper. Water blooms, very pretty, could be useful as flowers. Next, I'm gonna show you guys how to use salt in your watercolor technique, and it's really easy. We're gonna do a wash of color, not too wet, let it kind of soak into the paper a little bit and then sprinkle some salt onto it. So I'm using kosher salt because it has a larger flake particle. I've tried using Himalayan pink salt because you can get them in big chunks. You can't really see much of a difference between that and kosher salt. And table salt will also work, but you get little bitty fine crystals. Or So it's really all about how big you want your blooms to be. And this could be a great technique for flowers or snowflakes or just to add a little bit of random beauty to your watercolor. Because to me, that's what a lot of watercolor is about. 
on one half of this demonstration, I did dry brush, which is basically when the water in the brush can't keep up with the speed that you're moving the brush across the paper and the texture of the paper surface. So you want it to be a little bit dry, but not too dry when you're dragging your brush across the paper. And it's easier to get this kind of technique with a flat than it is to get this kind of technique with a round, although it is possible with a round. And this technique could be great for say, concrete or stone textures, brick textures. It could also be great for kind of like waves, getting the light hitting the top of the waves. It could also be useful for sort of a rainy sort of technique like we've got going on here. So we can already start to see the little blossoms, the little snowflakes from our salt crystals. There are a few little tricks to this. Don't sprinkle it directly into a puddle of water. Use a thirsty brush and soak up the excess water first. You want it to be damp, but not, you know, totally wet. And it's not gonna work on dry paper. So you wanna get it while the paper is still wet enough for the salt to push the pigment out. So it's a lot like our water blooms where the salt is pushing the pigment away from itself. So we're gonna let this dry totally. And then I'm going to use a drafting brush to remove our salt. The next technique is also really cool and it's yet another one of these dropping non-watercolor things into watercolor. We're going to drip a little bit of rubbing alcohol. So in this spray bottle I have 99% isopropyl rubbing alcohol and I'm actually just going to use the feeder tube to drip some alcohol into our still wet watercolor. You can use an eyedropper, you can flick it on with an old toothbrush. There's a lot of different ways that you can apply it and I encourage you to play around and explore and find different methods for playing around with rubbing alcohol. Now I will warn you guys that rubbing alcohol does have a tendency to degrade the surfaces that it's on over time. It can eat through the surfaces. So it's a technique that's very pretty and kind of cool but not one I myself use all that often because it does shorten the lifespan of our watercolor illustrations. Unfortunately, the results are not that impressive. We get kind of like little octopus suckers. Now on Yupo, which is a polypropylene paper or a plastic paper, you're gonna get a much more striking result, but this soaked into the paper way too quickly for it to really do a whole lot. But different papers and different colors will yield different results. So if you're kind of intrigued by this technique, please, please feel free to play around. Next, I'm gonna demonstrate a troubleshooting or a fixing technique, lifting out. There are a few different ways that you can do this. I'm gonna demonstrate one method that we do while the watercolor is still wet, and then one method that we do after the watercolor is dry. And for this, you will need a paper towel. You could use textured paper towels and get kind of a neat texture when you lift out. That could be really useful. I'm just using a Viva paper towel, mostly because there isn't a lot of texture to it. And you're also going to want a stiffer watercolor brush. Nothing so stiff that it tears up the paper. They do make scrubber brushes, and while those do work really well, they can abrade the paper. But I find just a fairly stiff synthetic, usually a flat, or I'm sorry, this is a, this is an angled brush like this works really well for lifting out watercolor. Now, not all watercolors are going to lift the same amount. Staining colors, i.e. colors that are more finely granulated or dye-based, they're gonna be less likely to lift out while after it's had a chance to dry. More granulating colors are gonna be more likely to lift out after it's had a chance to dry. <laughs> 
this next panel, I'm going to demonstrate several different types of resist techniques. You use a resist technique when you either want to prevent water from going into an area or when you want to preserve a prior color or if you want to kind of create a boundary between colors. And there's a few different ways to do it. So we're going to start with using masking tape. I'm using MT washi tape for this. We are then going to do wax crayon. I don't really care for this particular kind of wax crayon because they're very, very soft. I wrapped it in washi tape to kind of give it some more impact so that it could stand up to <laughs> just regular use. Uh, I actually prefer the ones that come with a like a black and white wrapper. You can use Crayola crayons for this, but it's not going to give you a clear resist. It's just going to give you a resist. And I can demonstrate that another time. And then finally, I will demonstrate masking fluid. So I'll talk about each technique as we go, starting with the masking tape. Now, I tried a bunch of different washi and masking tapes, and Empty is one of my favorites. I'm trying to find the start on this because it's a new one. It comes in a variety of sizes. If you watch my Stash Buster tutorials, you have probably seen this before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a few lines on the white of our paper. So that's going to preserve the white paper. I'm going to press down firmly so that it makes really good contact with it. And I'm just going to do several lines like this. And then once I'm done, I'm going to do a wash of watercolor. So not only are we going to be doing some resist techniques in this panel, but we're also going to be doing some color glazes. So it's a good chance to kind of refresh your memory since the glazes were the technique we started with. And the resists are the technique we're almost finished with. We've got one, well, really two maybe even three, might cram three techniques into the last panel, what? But we definitely got two more that I'm gonna try to put in there. There are a bunch of different watercolor techniques. Don't be afraid to mix and match your own or watch other YouTubers or other artists to see what kind of techniques they bring into their art because that can be a great way to learn a new skill. Our first layer has mostly dried. We're gonna move on now to the only not removable type of masking or resist, our wax resist. And the reason this isn't removable, I mean, you could maybe heat it up and blot it out, but really you can't like, eat, I mean, you could scrape it off, but it's gonna get like kind of stuck in the fibers. So wax resist is a more permanent resist, but it can be great for adding in little highlights. And it'll be interesting to see what our score lines here, the slightly darker lines, are a little harder to see on camera, what they do. I'm using this as a chance to try out four techniques. Now, you wanna wait till the paper is fairly dry because otherwise it's gonna be too soft and it's not gonna have enough texture to really grip the wax. Masking fluid can be really tricky, so I've got some tips that should ho help you be successful. First of all, find the masking fluid that works for you. And this varies by artists. I have friends who like Schminka. I've had really bad experiences with Schminka. I happen to like the Winsor & Newton Art Masking Fluid. This is the tinted kind, so it has a little bit of yellow tint. It shouldn't stay in your paper, but I have had problems with the tinted Miskit which is tinted with an orange staining my paper. So you may want to test it out first. This is removable masking fluid. You need to make sure it says removable because Winsor & Newton makes non-removable masking fluid. I don't know why. And uh, it doesn't necessarily say it's super big. Like you see, you have to read down here. And you have to be really careful if you're ordering it online to make sure you're getting the stuff that you want. And I have a trick for this because it can spoil very quickly since it's a latex-based product. The more you open it, 
the quicker it's going to spoil. So what I like to do is I like to put it in these things called dinky dips, which are small screw top cups. I found a vendor called Oblique Love Letters who even offers these little dinky dip holders that are suction cup based. They are great. And this allows you to portion out just a little bit of, of masking fluid. So if it spoils, your little bit is going to spoil, not your whole bottle. And that makes the bottle last longer. Next, you want to wait till your paper is dry to apply your masking fluid. And you want to wait till your paper is dry to remove your masking fluid. The dry to remove your masking fluid is the really, really key part. Sometimes I will let it dry out overnight just to be sure if I've really saturated my paper, like with some of those stash buster bookmarks. But I wouldn't let it sit on too long. I wouldn't let it sit on your paper longer than three days. I usually try to get it off within 24 hours if I can help it. Then I use a synthetic watercolor brush. So one that if I ruined it, it wouldn't break my heart to apply my masking fluid. And I wet it and then I scrub it onto brush soap. Get that soap into the bristles. That's gonna protect the bristles and keep it from soaking up into this metal part, the ferrule. So that makes it easier to wash the masking fluid out later. And then I use these things called masking fluid pickups when I'm removing, everything wants to stick to these. When I'm removing my masking fluid, this is one from Dollar Tree. It works just as well as the kind you can get at Michael's or you can get online. So if you got a cheap one, that works. Some people are able to use their finger to kind of remove it. I don't have any luck with that, so I use a masking fluid pickup. At least with the Windsor and Newton masking fluid, I know it's ready for the next layer when it's completely clear, when you're not seeing any more of that white or you're not really seeing a whole lot of that color. Now, if you're using different brands like the Schmincke, it is a very bright blue. It can be hard to tell when it's fully dry, so it can be hard to tell when to put your next layer on, but that you know it's a your mileage may vary sort of situation and different artists have different favorites so while i'm going to share some recommendations if you like something different if something different works for you use what works for you So since I have to wait for this to completely dry before I can remove the masking fluid, anyway, I'm gonna treat this like a twofer and show you guys another technique, and that is very easy splatters. I'm gonna demonstrate it while the paint is still wet and then what it looks like after it dries. So very similar to wet into wet, we're gonna get kind of a diffused splatter effect. If we drip our, or splatter, our watercolor into our still wet watercolor. Now you can use a toothbrush. You can use a brush like this and kind of knock on it. You can use a synthetic brush and kind of flick it. There's a lot of different ways to do splatter, but I find working with a softer brush and working with my watercolor very loose, very wet, is a great way to kind of get these softer diffuse splatter effects. And another thing, the bigger your brush, the, so I use a round for this typically, the bigger your brush and the wetter your mix is, the bigger the splatters, but the less saturated they're going to be. So if you want really big splatters, use a larger brush. If you want really small, fine splatters, use a smaller brush, but those really tiny, like single hair brushes basically, not really gonna give you the splatter effect you're looking for. So there is kind of a too small, although I have yet to encounter a brush too large to give a cool splatter effect. So since I have to wait for this to dry anyway to do my next splatter effect and to remove my masking fluid, I figure we'll move on to our last technique and that is using a spray bottle full of clean water, in this instance, filtered clean water and using that to kind of move some paints around. And I use this mainly for foliage techniques. So I'm gonna start with just a wash of yellow and that'll be kind of our, our background color. I'm gonna allow that to dry and then I'm gonna paint in some faux foliage pretty thickly. So like the paint's gonna be pretty dry when I apply it. And then I'm gonna spritz it while it's still wet to encourage some movement. Now, you can spritz it if it's really, really saturated, but looking a little color by numbers-y, numbers you can spritz it 
and kind of encourage it to move that way. You can also spritz it after it's dried and then use the lift technique and you can lift out dew drops like that. So if you guys watch my tutorials, then you guys see I really love splatter techniques and I really love water spritz techniques. So there are a myriad of different ways you can use these 12, 12 plus techniques to create your own beautiful and unique watercolor paintings. While this is drying, I'm gonna swing back over to this and we can do our splatter effect wet over drying just to see how that changes things up. And there are a lot of great techniques that I haven't even been able to talk to you guys about today, like negative painting or like using gradients, uh, not gradients, using granulation in lots of different from ways or just different ways to combine all of these techniques. I'm going to use a splatter technique to lift out dew drops on our uh, leaves here. You can also, if it's heavily applied or thickly applied paint, you can also spritz it to get it to reactivate and run in a more controlled manner than what we have here where it was mostly still wet. So if you want larger dew drops, you can use the end of your feeder tube and just kind of place them. I mean, you could use a brush to do this as well. I'm not getting as large of dew drops as I might like, so I'm going to switch over. And you want to do it kind of quick. You want the water to kind of pool because that gives you a little more time. But you also want, and I'm just clumsy, you also want it to stand up on top so that you have more time to kind of figure out where you want your dew drops and to kind of place them. So a trick with this is you don't have to lift up every one if you don't like them. You can just lift up the ones in places that you like. You can also use splatter techniques. So I'm using just dropping a drip for the bigger ones. You can also use your splatter technique to get smaller ones. Now my brush is slightly dirty, so the water coming from it is slightly blue. But if you use clean water, that won't be an option. That won't be a problem. You can also use it to get the leaves to move a little bit more if you want them to, like I said. So then we're gonna go through and you can see it actually lifts up a little bit. So then what you could do after that, you could let it dry and then you could use white gouache or white watercolor pencil to add in some highlights that'll really make it look like dewdrops. And I've got, I love painting foliage. 
So I've got lots and lots of tutorials here on the channel where I really kind of walk you through that process, but it's a technique I use all the time. So I wanted to show it to you guys. You could also use this for bubbles. You could use this on flowers. You could use this to add in insects. I mean, I'm talking in a very botanical way about it, but I think if you've got some imagination, you can kind of see. So all it really does, now with more granulating colors, it's gonna lift up more. With this phthalo blue, it's a bit more staining, so it didn't lift up quite so much. If you let it sit longer, you might have a better chance of it lifting, but it lifts up just enough that it looks like the under color of the dewdrop, like the dewdrop is reflecting the color through the water. And then when you add your highlights, it'll look a lot more realistic. And then let's say we want some of this blue to blend with our green a little bit better, just to kind of diffuse it out. So it kind of tones the background area. We can spritz it because it hasn't been dried that long and that'll get it to kind of diffuse out and kind of influence the area around it. Generally, I try to kind of keep everything self-contained rather than working on a bunch at one time. But since these two were going to be the most time consuming, I kind of worked back and forth. So this has dried out totally, completely, fully. It's dried out overnight. We're gonna start by removing the masking tape. And as you guys can see, it gives us really nice, clean lines, a good masking tape. You're not going to get water seeping underneath it. So that's one of the reasons I like the MT washi tape is that it's a little bit more accessible here in the U US than some of the other brands that are really good. And you get these really nice clean lines and you can get it in a variety of sizes. Fortunately, the camera's picking it up, but you can also see with the score lines that I created using the plastic back of my flat brush. And many flat brushes do come with that kind of score line thing they're a little bit darker. So this is a technique that some people use. It's a newer technique to me, and it's not really one I can see a lot of use for in my work, just because if I want a darker line, I'll go in with a watercolor brush and just do that. But I wanted to show it to you guys because it's a really easy technique, and there was no reason not to demonstrate it. So then, with our masking fluid, I'm using our masking fluid pickup, which is basically just made out of masking fluid boogers. And generally, I scrub as little as possible, just enough to get the masking fluid to come up. So you want a somewhat, <sighs> you don't want a super thick application, but you do want it thick enough that it's actually going to mask your watercolor. You can do layers of masking fluid and kind of build it up. I've got some Stash Buster tutorials where I demonstrate just that. And masking fluid can be used in a lot of different ways. Some people use it to reserve the white of the paper so you get those white highlights rather than using gouache, which is an opaque watercolor. Some people use it to mask off areas of color like I'm doing here, it makes it a little bit quicker. Some people use it as kind of the start to negative painting just to mask off those shapes so they can refine them later. Some people use them to add in some randomness with splatter techniques like this, there's a lot of different ways you can use masking fluid in your work. Don't be afraid of it, but I do encourage you to really kind of play around with it and get comfortable with it because it does take some getting used to and some artists pick it up real quick. Some artists like myself really kind of struggled with it for a long time before they figured out a masking fluid and a technique for masking fluid that really works for them in their art. And then with our wax resist and that was a softer wax crayon so it didn't really we didn't get as like sharp a line it's more of like kind of like a more noise more white noise because it doesn't all adhere to the valleys in the paper mostly to the surface a harder wax crayon is going to do a better job kind of mashing down those hills so that it covers both the hills and valleys but it can be a great technique as well. You see we get kind of like a dappled light effect. It's got kind of a softer effect than our masking fluid, which is a really harsh line, or our masking tape, which is again, a really harsh line. So those are all methods for reserving color or masking off color. We have two removable ones. You could paint on top of either of these if you want to. Whereas with the wax resist, it is always going to be a wax resist right there. It is always going to repel color. Hopefully this has got those creative juices going. So here we have 12 plus common, easy to execute watercolor techniques. 
There are loads more techniques and lots of other ways that you can really personalize your watercolors, whether it's your choice in brush, your paper, or how you handle those materials. But if you guys have any questions about watercolor techniques, if you'd like to see anything explored more fully that I didn't cover today, you can let me know down in the comments below, but I highly recommend you check out my quick and easy watercolor playlist, my watercolor basics playlist, as well as my watercolor basics page over on my old blog, natasoup.blogspot.com. And I hope you'll check out my Stash Buster watercolor tutorials, which are designed to be very effective, quick, fun, and easy. And speaking of our Stash Buster watercolor bookmarks, let me go grab them and kind of walk you guys through which of these techniques I use in which of those bookmarks, because the focus for most of those is one to two techniques very simple, very achievable, just to get you guys comfortable with watercolor and making watercolor art or useful items that you'll actually enjoy. Kind of on that note, last year during World Watercolor Month, I did a few live streams where I walk you guys through some of my favorite things, whether it's my favorite materials or my favorite techniques or, you know, demonstrating things for you guys or answering your questions. And I think I'm really proud of those live streams. Those are some of my favorite live streams that I've done. You guys were awesome. I was able to like really connect with y'all and play around and demonstrate watercolor. It was just all around great. So I would really recommend you check those out as well because we were able to cover a lot of ground in them. And a lot of what I'm talking about in this crash course, I was able to go into a little bit more depth and answer some common questions that I might not have thought of since I had an audience that might be helpful for you guys. So that brings up this bookmark here. This was one of the ones done during one of those live streams. It's a very simple one where we are using a wet into wet technique in order to get these kind of cool bleeds, these kind of neat water gradations. We did two layers of that. So the first layer, very soft, very pastel. I masked it off with masking fluid and then I painted a second layer on top of it and then removed the masking fluid. Very simple, but very cute. This is a very achievable technique. Then this is a really cool tutorial, although this is upside down and very easy. This is mainly focusing on wet into wet with granulating watercolors, mainly in shades of blue, but you could use whatever colors you like. After that fully dried, I went over it with gold ink in a nib and added in some beautiful golden stars. So very simple, very easy, but the impact is really cool. This is kind of a play on this except multiple layers of masking fluid to really build up kind of those layers of color. So the very first layer that was put down, so it's kind of like cell painting. The very first layer that was put down is the lightest, the brightest, the one that appears closest to the viewer. And then as we do our subsequent layers, they seem to recede in the background because they get darker and they are overlapped by our prior layers. And then finally, I went in with PBK 11 Lunar Black, which is a really heavily granulating black color for that like background black, back, background black that makes these really seem to pop and makes them seem like they're neon. Again, very, very easy. It just really requires patience and some materials. This is kind of a play on this with the addition of some dripping wet into wet to get tie dye techniques and also using saran wrap to kind of give us almost like a wave-like appearance to our water. There's also a lot of um, graduated washes, which are very simple to do. We just brush in our color, then brush in the next layer while it's still wet, both with the undercolors as well as with the watercolor itself or the color of the water, I should say. So really easy, pretty effective, and it turned out really cute. This is still kind of a play on that, mostly with developing contrasting colors, developing neons, and then using a little bit of white gouache to make some of our outlines pop. And this is inspired by lens flares. I was trying to demonstrate how to paint a type of lens flare very easily. So I really like how this turned out. It's super simple. It's very achievable for anybody who wants to give it a try, but I think that's part of what makes it really cool.
Now here is a slight departure in a way from what I'm demonstrating here in that it's more of a pictorial bookmark. This is from the Easter series that I did. This is the rabbit, but I think it stands alone just as a cute year round sort of thing. So we've got a gradated wash. We've got some lifting out to make clouds using a paper towel. We've got some glazing to paint in the grass. And we've also got some brushwork here in how we painted the rabbit. So it looks more complicated than it actually is, but I was really pleased with how it turned out. Speaking of glazing, this is a very, very simple bookmark. It is literally just glazes, but it looks pretty dang cool. The colors really seem to scintillate, and it's an exploration of how different colors layer on top of each other and what kind of effects we can get. So we start out with a cooler yellow, then orange, then a hot pink. Then we use ultramarine blue, so a granulating blue, phthalo blue, hooker's green, then we have dioxine purple and then finally black. And the purple is so rich that it's almost blacker than the black. So playing on that, I use, this was a three in one kind of tutorial. And I use that as the basis for this beautiful watercolor sunset bookmark. Very simple using techniques we've already talked about for the most part. So using our glazes and I show you a cheat for creating a graduated wash in stages and in layers and then washing it out with water. So very easy using masking fluid, leaving the white of the paper still visible and then dripping in a more opaque color while it's still wet. So part of my goal with these Stash Buster tutorials is to really build on concepts we've already covered and you produce something different every single time. So this is really cute. This is a solar system bookmark. So still playing on our masking techniques, playing on some splatter techniques, playing on layering and glazing techniques, but it's, if you can paint a circle, you can create this bookmark. This beach scene seems really complicated, I'm so pleased with how this one turned out, but it's actually very simple. It's some wet into wet washes. It's some glazing. It's some masking. It's some masking again. It's some wet into wet drips to get those colors to diffuse. And it's some splatters of masking fluid. And it's a little bit of glazing, just doing some brushwork to create those pebbles. Really simple, very, very basic to do, but it turned out really pretty. A lot of these are gonna end up falling in the masking fluid category because masking fluid can make something that's very simple seem a lot cooler than it is because it really allows you to play with color without having to worry about getting a darker color in an area where you don't want it. Now this, I'm not super happy with myself, so I'm actually revising this tutorial. But what I really wanted to focus on was color play. So using really bright neons as the undercolor and then glazing darker blues on top of it and seeing how those colors play together. And I kind of obscured that with white gouache. So that's why I'm redoing this. But we use masking fluid to mask out the scales initially. So obviously there is room for so many other kinds of tutorials. Most of these bookmarks fall into I could actually sneak this one. This one falls into more categories, fortunately. But like here with the water blooms, I actually want to go back and do a flower tutorial with you guys because that's got me inspired. This would make for beautiful little snowflakes. And then honestly, our glazes, our wet into wet, our graduated washes, our wet over dry, our dry into dry, and our dry over dry. Those are techniques I use all the time in my larger watercolor illustrations and in my comic pages. So even though it's not, I mean, this one here is definitely a combination of all of those, the whole top row there, this one covers everything. Actually, many of these, even though I toss them into the masking fluid. Oh, and then all these white borders, that's washi tape. That's just taping it down for support, but it also gives us a pretty white border. Hopefully this shows you guys how you can take these basic techniques and with just a little, such a small amount of additional painting and additional time, you can turn it into something that's both cute and functional while practicing your techniques.
Okay, so it's a little bit challenging to get all of these techniques in the shot with me, but I am going to try my best for the time being. Today, we painted so many different watercolor techniques. I hope you guys learned a lot. I would call the top six my core watercolor techniques, the ones I use all the time in basically every painting. And then the ones at the bottom, some of them I do use almost every painting, like lifting out and like spray techniques because I just can't help myself but some of them are techniques I wanna explore more and I think they could add a lot of fun stuff to my art. So hopefully I've turned you guys on to some new watercolor techniques, maybe something that will help you take your art to the next level. Don't be afraid to experiment because even if you feel like you've ruined something, there's often a lot of ways that you can salvage it. And I've got some great tutorials in my favorite watercolor tutorials playlist and my watercolor and art walkthroughs playlist that should help you out because those are for bigger illustrations that I didn't necessarily plan. I mean, I planned them out as I went along, but it wasn't like, let me show you step one. Let me show you step two. You know what I mean? They were just like paintings I was going to paint that I then recorded and I narrated over. So there's a lot of trial and error and making mistakes and figuring things out and self-reflection, which could be a great way to learn if you feel like you're kind of stagnating and you want to see how other artists solve their problems. Speaking of solving their problems, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me down in the comments below. I do want to point out, because I know I know I'm gonna hear about it and that's okay I kind of encourage that there are a few different ways to do a graduated wash I do demonstrate them a lot in my stash busters tutorial I could not prop this paper up when I was painting it because it was unsupported and generally what I would like to do is prop it up put my darkest color at the top and then work my way down and I may end up recording a segment and cutting that in because I do think it's important to demonstrate that. But on this paper, in this format, it was a little more challenging for me to do it like that. So I did it the way I used to do it, just to demonstrate that there are a lot of different ways that you can do a graduated wash. And there's a lot of ways you can do color into color washes as well. So hopefully you'll check out my Stash Buster series where I walk you through how to do those kinds of washes. So if you're looking for more great, easy watercolor tutorials, I gotta put this down, this thing is so big. If you're looking for more great watercolor tutorials, I've got you covered. I've got the Stash Buster series, which is designed for people who'd like to get into watercolor, but maybe don't know how to draw or they're not confident in their drawing skills. They are simple and easy watercolor tutorials that are designed to use watercolor scraps of paper. So you're not even spending a whole lot of money, but they demonstrate different techniques in a way that should hopefully be more accessible to people who don't have a lot of time, would like to learn how to paint, and would like to make something that is actually pretty when they're finished painting painting rather than our crash course where we, we made a lot of swatches basically but not necessarily anything that you would feel proud of or want to show your friends. I also have my quick and easy watercolor tutorials playlist where I demonstrate a bunch, a bunch of watercolor techniques as well as some things that you can paint along with. That's an older series but I do hope you guys will check it out. If you enjoy my art it would really mean a lot to me if you consider joining me over on TikTok. I'm at NatoSoup on all social media. And if you'd like to, it would really also mean a lot to me if you would check out my watercolor comic, 7-Inch Kara. You can read it for free as a webcomic at 7inchkara.com. Or if you're a fan of books or you want to support my work, you can buy them at 7inchkara.com slash shop. So the Natto Shop and Volume 1 and Volume 2 are both available. So I had a lot of fun in this Crash Course series. It's been a while since I did a, a big overarching watercolor tutorial series and this is just in time for World Watercolor Month. So if you were hoping to get painting this July, hopefully I've given you the confidence and the knowledge that you need to get started. If you enjoyed this video or if you enjoyed this series, it would really mean a lot to me if you left me a big old thumbs up. Not only does that tell me that you liked it, but it also tells YouTube that you liked it and they're gonna show it to more people, which would be such a tremendous way to help out this channel. It would also mean a lot to me if you've got a friend or a family member who's interested in watercolor, if you would send them this series. Help spread the word because your positive word of mouth goes a really, really long way and it really means a lot to me. So uh, both of those are great ways to support what I'm doing, checking out my work and sharing my work with other people. If you're new, make sure you hit that subscribe button and click the bell notification to let YouTube know that you wanna hang out with me and you wanna see more from me. Theoretically, 
theoretically, because I don't know when I'm going to have the time to record the other two that I was considering doing, one of which is a walkthrough where I just, I paint something and I just walk you through every single technique I'm using them in real time as I'm doing those techniques. The other is very focused on handling the paints themselves. So I paint a painting and I walk you through everything I'm doing from color selection to color mixing to how much water I'm using to when I'm switching out my water. I'm thinking about adding those to this series because I know both of those would be of interest to people. And I know those are areas people struggle with. So I'm considering doing those, but I don't know when I'm gonna have the time. So I will probably be able to do the troubleshooting live stream with you guys before I get to do those. So what I want to do is I wanna answer all your questions live with live demonstrations in a live stream hangout. So if you have any questions, if you wanna see anything demonstrated, make sure you let me know in the comments down here or, or, or over on the paint box or save your questions and come hang out. I'm gonna be collating all the questions anyway, so if you feel like you're not gonna be able to remember them, don't worry, I got you, friend. So hopefully I'll see you guys again soon. I've got lots more watercolor tutorials and walkthroughs coming up, and I am currently working on a vlog for my process of chapter nine of Seven Inch Kara. So if you're interested in comics, if you're interested in watercolor, if you're interested in watercolor comics, I hope you guys will check that out. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. Hopefully it was useful, helpful, and informative. And hopefully it was helpful in making art a habit. Huge, huge, such huge thanks. Such huge thanks to my amazing patrons on Patreon because it is only thanks to their support and generosity that series like this where there's a lot of consumables are possible. And huge thanks to my patrons because they make my reviews possible as well. So if you like what I do and you wanna help me continue to do it, you can join me over on Patreon and it would be a big ol' help. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I look forward to hanging out with you guys for our troubleshooting live stream. Bye!